So uh, thank you for taking the time to come and hear my presentation. We have some slides to go through, so I hope I won't bore you. Um, I, I chose to uh, give this rather ambiguous name to the, the talk, computation, and then this weird sign changes to practice, question mark. Um, and I realized after having sent off that title that some people may not know what that means. And essentially that notation in C sharp is not equal to. Um, so essentially what I wanted to say with this is that computation or the use of computers in architecture is not necessarily equal to a change in practice. So in order to sort of go further from that initial uh, statement, we need to talk about what practice is generally. And generally speaking, in sort of the current landscape, you have an architect who makes drawings, who sends it to a fabricator or contractor. And then depending on what stage you're in, they might get some feedback on some design iterations, and then the architect will make new drawings, and so on and so forth. Um, and I was in practice, and I, I didn't really like this paradigm. So I left practice, moved back home to Denmark, uh, where I'm now teaching and researching at the School of Architecture in Aarhus, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so the, the working question that I've asked myself throughout this talk is, is there a way that we can nudge practice? Can we nudge it in a different direction where we change the current paradigm? So what I'll basically go through is a little bit of history about myself, like what I have gone through, not, not as in personally, but professionally. Um, I have been the co-director of a uh, AA visiting school called AA Aarhus which was between the AA and the Aarhus School of Architecture. I'll talk a little bit about my own practice. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about robots and how we use them pedagogically at the, the Aarhus School of Architecture and how I have grown to actually be rather fond of them. So computers and architecture is not really a new thing. This is even Sutherland. Uh, and him showing his PhD thesis called Sketchpad, which is an initial proposal for a CAD software where you would actually have a pen or a stylus where you would talk, uh, draw on a screen. So very similar to iPad Pros and so on today. So iPad isn't, or Apple isn't as revolutionary as they think. Um, and also computers started to become very big in architecture in the 90s. Here's an example of Greg Lynn, uh, where he used animation to explore what he called the embryological house. Um, and also some early examples of how, let's call it computational form, became actual reality through the Kunsthaus Graz in 2003 by Peter Cook and Crab Studio. And then I would like to move on to saying that what I've just shown is not stuff that was initially inspiring to me. Um, what actually made me also go through with architectural education is someone showed me this in 2008. And this is a very, very simple mesh relaxation algorithm. And those that have played a little bit with kangaroo and uh, grasshopper will know that this is super easy. But this blew my socks off. I was like, this is super cool. I want to know more about this. Um, and that led me into sort of my first digital fabrication workshop where I designed this little piece of furniture uh, that we had exhibited in Copenhagen and, and locally. And then. We ended up designing a pavilion in 2010, just before I went here to MTEC, which was a performance space in relation to this cultural week that was happening in uh, the city where I grew up called Olbo in northern Denmark. And then having dealt with a lot of geometry, I started to look into more autonomous systems where this is a fissarium slime mold which starts to form uh, minimal networks between food sources. So the pink dots are food sources, and the, the lines are then slowly moving towards an equilibrium of a minimal network, what you could classify as a Steiner tree, which is an NP-hard problem. So they're pretty difficult to solve, especially in 3D. And these guys do it just over time. Um, something I started to look into while I was here at MTech was reaction diffusion, which for those that don't know what that is, it's a series of formulas on morphogenesis developed by Alan Turing to back in the 50s, uh, where he wrote a paper on, on this and described all the formulas. And this is, people started to do it in 2D, and this is a, a 3D example of it uh, wrapped with a, a mesh through a margin cube algorithm. 
But all these are very interesting, um, and 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 I also, when I was here at, at MTech, I did my thesis on what we dubbed associative hydrological urban metabolism, where we looked at uh, how we could generate cities over time as a function of their internally generated resources. So these last three examples started to divert from what I actually started out being interested in, was how these, how computers and computation started to affect practice and the act of making. And here, we, I got a little bit away from that, so it became more theoretical, and, and I was like, I needed to get back into making. And while I was in practice here in, in the UK, I was at AKT2, uh, which is a structural engineering consultancy where I worked at the metrics uh, applied research team, as they called it, part. Um, and while I was there, I was also doing these uh, visiting schools. Um, which started out as an ambition of the Aarhus School to try and showcase some of their new facilities. So this is a rather lengthy list of some of the stuff that they have. So we have two laser cutters, digital cutter, which is basically just fancy words for a knife cutter, uh, three axis milling machine, five axis milling machine, 10 robots of various sizes, a lot of ultimakers, an SLS printer, plaster printer, porcelain printer and a five axis water jet. So they had a lot of stuff that they wanted to showcase and we then formed this relationship to try and do so. So we started out asking this rather simple question that we wanted to explore the theme of rethinking patterns and how we could through local manipulations of geometry manipulate light. And based on that, I of course, I'm sorry, I forgot this slide. We had uh, a series of sponsors that helped us with material and some funding as well, and of course we have to give thanks to them. Um, but the way in which we wanted to tackle the question was through uh, discretization, so decomposing objects into smaller parts. Um, where we found a lot of inspiration in Las England, uh, Vlad Tenu, and of course Mark Forens from The Very Many, uh, and their work. So we, in 2015, we sat down and, and started to develop this uh, framework for modeling complex geometries where we could then control these strips. Um, and we made this prototype that we on the first day showed the students and was, this is, this is what we would like you to explore. And then they did that, um, which is very different from what we had set up, but we uh, accommodated and, and they actually produced some very interesting Results, they ended up making this uh, wooden arch. This is only one of the projects that was done at the, the 2015 visiting school. And what was really cool about their process was that they managed to have this outline that they could convert into a mesh, and then they could actually form find it uh, through kangaroo and grasshopper so that they could predict how the form would be based on their cut pattern. And then they could actually unfold it again after they had done some geometrical manipulations to it. So they actually achieved a very nice feedback between model uh, in the digital, but also the physical model. And I thought that that was a, a great sort of um, learning experience to take away from that. Um, and because all the students didn't want to use the plastic we had bought, we ended up producing some examples um, and getting further into what this type of, these type of geometries would, would do and how they would behave. Um, so, what's interesting about this photo is it's the first visiting school, but just pay attention to how not cluttered it is, and you'll see what I mean in a little bit. So, now we go to 2016, where we managed to get some financial funding, so we could get uh, more material and we could sponsor students. Uh, we got that from a fund called Elpe Müller Fund, um, and we used that to then buy materials and actually make a catalog of different geometrical variations of how we could discretize meshes and what they would do in terms of structure, uh, potential for form, um, light emittance, and so on. So here are three of those uh, uh, studies that, that was performed where the lowest one had a particular interest uh, because it was very uh, self-supporting and it didn't use any additional material, meaning that the entire little sculpture is done by one material, it has no the materials to join, and, and so on. It's not using any rivets and, and so on. Um, but because we had all these 
this funding, we wanted to try and see if we could build a pavilion, uh, which was a very overambitious task, I think. But uh, we, we gave it a go. Uh, unfortunately, it ended up like this, so a big mess. <laughs> Uh, on in, in the same space as before, and it simply wouldn't stand up, and I'll show you in a little bit why. So I normally call that project just death by pavilion. Uh, nonetheless, it was a very good learning experience. Um, but the problem was we didn't have enough connections, so it was too flimsy. Uh, and I'll show in a little while what that basically means if we were to build this in one-to-one in -one where it would stand up, because I'm pretty sure it would, but we would just need a lot of connections. So what was interesting as well about 2016 was we introduced a second track where we had one that explored complex geometries and fabrication, and one that then explored robotics, uh, where we focused mainly on hot wire cutting. Um, and one project that really figured out the process uh, produced this sculpture, which is uh, really nice. And I ended up calling that project for the loaf of bread uh, pavilion, because essentially what they did was they took a big piece of EPS foam, and then they cut inside of that uh, the different pieces that they wanted, and then they just started slicing it afterwards. So they sort of cut it like a loaf of bread. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic. So they could really quickly produce these complex assemblies. And uh, they, they ended up using the bigger robot where all the other groups used the smaller ones. Um, so that was a really good point of departure for what started to happen in 2017, where we then made the conscious choice of trying to collapse uh, these two methods of thinking. Because there are some really interesting methods of dealing with geometry to the left, and there are some interesting fabrication potential to the right. So why not try and merge those two together? So that's, that's what we did. We hybridized the full visiting school and went back to one cluster. And one of the ways in which we normally deal, dealt with these uh, studies is that we wanted people to cut a lot. So cut, cut a lot of foam, learn the process, and then you'll, you'll be able to then scale up and move to the bigger robot. So this was all done on the smaller one. Um, and it gave the the students a tested knowledge of what is hot wire cutting and what does it mean geometrically, because it is, a, in fact, a, quite a limiting process. But if you compare it to milling, it's several orders of magnitudes faster, and therefore it's really, really interesting. So here we have some students that are then setting up the initial workflow where they actually had to uh, flip the block. So they had to actually develop a met method of rotating the piece in space so that they could make two consecutive cuts that would then produce parts for this table. Um, and, and that was, I think they ended up producing a very nice result. But also, we, uh, we kept the ambition quite high and we wanted to make a pavilion again and see if we would break our necks again. But we uh, crossed our fingers and we, we then used a similar process as we had done before. So we, uh, used uh, meshes and form finding to produce the geometry. And then we could uh, navigate the geometry in such a way that we could translate the flat mesh into blocks. And then in having those blocks, uh, we could then start to cut them in a fabrication workflow, which was really well designed by one of my colleagues named Ryan Hoos. And he, uh, he's the guy that's in charge of the robot lab at the school, and he really knows how to set up a workflow so that we can, uh, we can produce at a quite a high rate. So what we had to do was cut it once, then rotate it 90 degrees, cut it again, and that's it. So in the cause of 24 hours, if not less, we managed to produce all these pieces, and then I think it took an hour or two to assemble them into these uh, nodes which we then put together in, uh, in the school's canteen where it was exhibited for a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, we couldn't take it outside because it's, uh, it would blow away. <laughs> uh, it would work really well if we made it in concrete, but uh, that's, a, that's another story. We might actually try and get some money to see if we can build it in concrete, but uh, it requires a, a good deal of funding. But 
What's interesting about this is that they used longer, a longer time to measure up where the pavilion should be than they used assembling it, uh, which I thought was really cool. So here is uh, it's the pavilion. I think it was four meters tall and covered at 20 square meters. So it was actually rather big and pretty well received of the school in general. Um, and I'll just go back to this pavilion because since 2016, it was nagging in the back of my head because I was like, we should be able to build this. It's not that hard. So I started to make a couple of prototypes. Uh, the pink uh, area highlighted there is then what this is. These are then one to two models. Um, and the one to the left is what we tried to do in, in 16. And unfortunately, we would, this has, I think, already 1,000 rivets, and they're 50 pounds. And the material is super cheap. So if you had to scale it up double, then let's say you need 2,000 rivets, that's 100 pounds, and then you only have a foot. Um, so I sort of did a rough estimate that we would probably have to spend six times the amount of, rev amount of money on rivets to put it together, as opposed to the price of the material. And I thought that was ridiculous. So I tried out the, the finger joints where you could actually start to put them together with the material itself. You wouldn't need rivets. And we would then try out and see how it would then uh, behave structurally. Um, and it actually got rather stiff in this area where you have curvature in two directions. Um, it had some problems along the sides, but I think that has to do with two things. One, the tolerance uh, of the fabrication, but also uh, the fact that it was single curved along the sides. Uh, and, uh, but I, and I thought, okay, let's try and see how this will behave if we scale it up and actually build it in one-to-one. -one. And I need to say the material that we've used throughout the three years is uh, one mil PVC. So it's really thin and it's really light and super cheap. Um, so I, uh, as part of this, the visiting school, I sometimes left the students a little bit. And then I went and I cut the entire pavilion and, and had some help to put it together. Where when you have to put this together with these um, finger joints, you need to kind of braid it together. And that's really tough for your hands. Uh, and it gets really annoying if you assemble it wrong. So the middle piece is wrong. Um, the right piece is correct, because we started from the inside, uh, and then we went outwards in ribbons. And that made it a lot easier. But I would still say, I, after this, and I still deal with it, I have a bad deal of cobble tunnels. So, uh, it's, uh, it wasn't, it, I would say it was worth it, but it's still uh, painful in my wrists. But um, we made it in uh, three separate pieces um, that we could then uh, assemble quite simply, or simple, uh, just to see if it would stand up, and it did, which uh, was quite, uh, what's it called, satisfying. Um, and we, just to talk a little bit about the process before we talk about where it was exhibited, the process is quite straightforward. We model a very crude mesh, and that doesn't need to be very pretty, as you can see. Um, and then we, in Rhino and Grasshopper, we smooth it once, and then we start to, uh, we form find it. Um, and then it's in this form finding process that you design something within a given equilibrium. Also, another thing that the prototypes taught me was don't make closed loops with this type of technique because it's really difficult to attach it together because you start to move the full structure as you put it together. So that's also why we ended up making it as, uh, as separate entities. Um, but what's interesting about this and what a lot of you might find useful is how we sort of uh, addressed certain elements of the form finding process because sometimes you just add one value uh, to, say, gravity. Um, but you can actually add that as a gradient. It's a little bit of a fuss, or not fuss, uh, what's it called, a cheat, because it's not how things work in, in real life. But you can actually start to then use form finding and physics as more of a design tool. Um, so here we applied a gravity gradient so that we would get these uh, bulges around the, the pavilion. And then we also added 
a gradient on the cables so that they would be weaker up here, so that you would get more of a bulge. Um, and then down here it would be tighter, so it wouldn't bulge out so much there. Um, and then we use the same gradient to then produce these pleats that would be deep at the bottom, and then at the top they would be more shallow, and then they would gradient, gradient down again to be a, a deeper pleat. Um, we then got in touch with this uh, yearly event called Aarhus Fest Uwe, which directly translates to Aarhus Party Week, uh, where a lot of different events happen over throughout the city of Aarhus. And uh, I managed to exhibit it in front of the town hall, which coincidentally is drawn by Anne Jakobsen, a very famous Danish designer and architect. He's probably turning over in his grave, but uh, we have to try something uh, to progress. So we did that. And what was really interesting about uh, the pavilion itself was uh, three things. So here to the left, uh, you have the assembly strategy, which we have used throughout the three years, which I think is very important. Uh, I don't know if you can see the numbering here, but essentially along each edge, we had a number specifying the number of the piece and the number of the piece going next to it. So we never needed any drawings to put these together. We just sat down and started putting them together. And then they, because they can only go together in one way. And then they would uh, go together really nicely. And then, when putting it together, an area that was really annoying was this, where you had these fingers along the strip, like you had here to the left. And sometimes you had to take them apart, and then they broke. But that didn't matter. So they actually started to form this very interwoven relationship due to the high amount of connections. And therefore, I don't think that this area would be needed, which would also reduce cutting time. And it would actually make it overall a more pleasant sort of experience to putting these together. So it was a, a very good learning experience to, uh, to do these uh, studies. Something that we use, which I'll get back to as well in a later slide, is this algorithm called k-means, which is a clustering algorithm. So here it's just clustering these points over time. And what it does is it does one clustering, then it finds a new average center for its new cluster and uses that to then cluster again. So it's an iterative system that then starts to make equal distribution of things. Um, and that one can, is super easy to, uh, it's, it's quite easy to write, but also it's super flexible because it just deals with a number of groups. So that's the only thing you need to specify is how many groups do you want. And then on top of that, you need to specify what the grouping is based on. So that can be warp of panels, it can be skew of panels, it can be, angular tolerance, it can be normal loop directions, it can be topological distances, it can be anything. And that's super interesting. So that was just to say how all the stuff we had done at the visiting school started to relate to practice. But now I'll try and talk a little bit about some stuff that I'm doing myself. And the point of departure for a lot of the stuff that I have done is I'm a little bit tired of funicular shapes. I know they're, in t they're smart and, and so on, but I'm like, why, whenever we start talking about computers, do we have to do something funicular? Um, so I started to look into that based on some of the stuff I just showed with the k-means. This is a study done by my, my colleague, Ryan Hughes, uh, where he started to mill along the UV directions of a NURB surface. Um, in case that's uh, Chinese for you guys, then here's a quick demonstrate of what that means. So you have these two uh, identical surfaces. This is the UV or the U direction for that one. That's the U direction for that. So you start to have these implicit information embedded inside the geometry, which can start to derive design explorations and outputs, which is super interesting. And I then took to a man to try and see where we could go with this. So I, I have this, as we all do, a library of people that we put in for renders and so on. So I took this guy and started to look at him and, and, and thought, what if I start to decompose him based on normal directions? Um, so I used my, my k-means algorithm to then break him down into sub-pieces, um, like so, so you can start to see that all the yellow is pointing in one direction and, and so on. So it started to form these clusters. 
which we can then abstract the straight line network from. And then we can 3D print some nodes for those. Uh, he's right there, he's just a bit washed out. But uh, you can see him here in profile and, and also some more detailed shots. And these nodes is, is part of a project that I was asked to do with uh, Esperan Sunogol, who's one of the leads at uh, Uriku Formwork. Uh, for some stuff he's doing for his PhD. Uh, and basically, the guy that I've just shown is part of this uh, sculptural series for an, an, an exhibition I have coming up. Um, so back to the, the research part of it. So Asbjorn came to me and asked, is there a way where you can do nodes automatically for a line network of n valence? meaning that you have a point and then there is any number of, of sticks going into it. And he also wanted it to be various sides and various sizes and so on, and, and all of that works. But what's interesting about it is, and, and in order to check this, I, I thought I had to uh, stress test it. So I did that through a student workshop at the School of Architecture which we call procedural spatial networks. So they had to sort of model through an algorithmic approach. And then we would automatically generate these nodes. We had success in producing 10 and 11 valence nodes. So I would say that it's success. Um, what's also interesting about it is I've embedded each of the nodes with all the same information that we had at the AA visiting school. So. Each node knows which node it is, and it knows which sticks goes into each node. So you actually never need to look at a 3D drawing of it. So the model itself becomes the drawing. So this is the direct representation of a digital model, but in real life. Uh, and, and then you can argue that it's a drawing in space. Um, so let's get on to some more technical stuff. So. As I mentioned earlier, the School of Aarhus has a great deal of robots. They have nine smaller ones and one big one. And I have never really been the biggest fan of robots because I never fully understood the potential of them. But after having been working with Ryan for some time, um, he, we have then had a lot of conversations. And this is essentially the most important bit. If you can make it move, you can do anything. That's it. That's the price of entry into using robotics. You need to figure out how to make it move. Um, and I have then become involved in a project uh, at the school uh, where we uh, explore how digital fabrication can be used in conventional construction. So we're going to design some uh, new pump station in Denmark, which is not the most architecturally sexy job, but we, we get to play a lot with uh, technology and try and see how they fit into uh, regular practice. And we started out with doing some uh, clay extrusions uh, with the large robot. And you always need to have a process video of that. So there you go. Um, and we actually started to get into this. Uh, based on the premise of talking about uh, no formwork uh, casting of concrete. So the idea is that we can print uh, these columns, uh, as this was a demonstrator for making a column, um, let's see, uh, which we then dried and fired. And we made them in modules so you could stack them. Uh, we could also print them in a, a bigger version, but that would require a slight uh, reset, uh, rejigging of the, the current setup we have for clay extrusion. Uh, but that's not the biggest problem. Uh, so we then also noticed that depending on how you, you dry these and what temperature you burn them, you start to have these discrepancies. Um, it started to gap a little bit between some of the layers. and. If you also paid attention to this one, you can see it starts to have a rotation. So that has to do with the moisture content of the clay and, and how it, it was fired and, and, and so forth, uh, which proves to be a bit more difficult to control. But um, 
that's an aesthetic in itself. But we tried to then make a very simple cast inside and started to talk to some of the engineers on the project and, and they thought this was a quite interesting idea uh, to then first and foremost avoid waste, waste of the, um, of the uh, formwork, but also that we would then have to look into how we could end up reinforcing the concrete inside. Uh, but in terms of building regulations, they thought that this could be plausible. So let's see. Um, but the general idea uh, that of this process would actually be to try and print it in concrete uh, and then have that as a shell and then fill that up with uh, concrete that is up to code with reinforcement and so on. Um, this is from the Design Modeling Symposium uh, and the project is by X3. I thought I would mention that. So um, I thought that now that I was starting to get into robotics uh, with uh, this research project, I had to try and have my own project for robots. And there was this project that was done some time ago at the school, uh, inspired by others, uh, where you 3D print inside of a container. And then you fill that with sand. So you extrude out some type of binder um, there's also a lot of people doing that now with uh, silicon and inside of a big vat of translucent silicon where they then print either concrete or something inside. Um, so, what that in it, so in itself, the process is not that new. But what I thought was interesting is how that when, when thinking of this project that I started a couple of months ago, it, it, it becomes really interesting when thinking about it in relation to the robots. So here, what I also wanted to do with it was to try and print the different aggregates. So here's plaster, and here's sand, and then I just started to look at it with a syringe and started to print inside of it just to see how it would react, trying to get the, the mixes correct and so on. So what I used to uh, print with in the plaster was water, and then PBA glue diluted with water. Um, this is what happened when you just poured a little bit of water inside of uh, plaster. You get this rather uncontrollable mess. Um, but uh, when you do the PBA glue, it actually sticks inside and, and levitates inside of 3D, which actually makes for a rather interesting exploration that I'll do uh, in the future. This is all done in my spare time, so. <laughs> um, but um, I then also, to get the mix right for the PBA glue and sand, I tried to do a couple of those. But um, what's interesting, and, and especially in relation to robots, is how the process of developing a tool is, which is essentially what I wanted to sort of get into. How, how do we start to fit this uh, open platform as we talk about it? Uh, how do we start to fit that with a tool that solves the job that I want? So I started out printing this guy, uh, which goes straight on the robot. And then I would just stand with the syringe to then try and, and tweak the whole process of, of the robot speed and its movement and so on, while I was then by myself extruding out the, the, the glue. Um, but the idea would be to then develop a better extruder, which is then uh, numerically controlled. So with, uh, with Arduino, that would then communicate back to the robot. So the robot could then specify to turn on and off and so on. Um, and the process of that is you start out by finding a gearing mechanism that works. So I needed something that would push on top of glue so that it would come out. Um, and it worked really well on this scale. But as with many things in life, when you scale it up, it doesn't work. So <laughs> I printed this really nice, uh, in my opinion, extruder. And then I tried it, and it just didn't want to move. So there are two things to do. Either I get a bigger motor, or I try and gear it differently. And what's interesting about that is there's always someone that has done it before you. So I found this guy uh, online that had made the universal paste extruder for 3D printers. And I was like, that's perfect. Um, so I'll probably mod this a little bit. But what's interesting about what he's doing with it, he's, he's printing um, glaze and cakes and stuff like that. Uh, he's just using the, a 3D print scaffold for it. But 
you know, to, e to each their own. Um, so back, back to the studies. So here's basically how the setup as of now looks. Um, and what's interesting is you can print almost anything because it's printed inside of its own support material. And there's also a lot to learn about sort of uh, how we, the speed at which it prints, the layer height and so on, and trying to then get into that. So when you start dealing with robots, it's not like you should go and try and do the final thing. You should always try and test everything 100 times before you get it right. Um, and I think that that's the most important thing about anything, really. Um, so why is this interesting? Uh, mainly related to the, the sand printing I just showed and why I find it interesting. It has to do with a research project I have just presented in Paris, uh, where we developed this um, little Arduino kit that can then gather data. And it also tracks you. So it's sort of Big Brother-ish. But it, it gives you um, a GPS location, which you can then map into Rhino. And then you can wrap it in this bespoke voxel modeler that I have written. Um, and then you can write the data of each of the positions in space to the voxel modeler. And then you can start to visualize that volumetrically through a marching cubes algorithm. What you can see here is how you can move a point around. So you can actually, if you have a location in real life, you can map it into Rhino, and then you can start to then visualize that in some way. And I hope that this is starting to become evident why I like the same printing, because we have already started to look into how we can have the robot send feedback out, but we can also send the feed feedback back so in doing this, we can actually have a model which can change over time, and then that will then alter the print. So I think that the control mechanism of the robot is actually super interesting and some stuff that's worth exploring. Um, this is a, a video from, from the Arduino project where we then start to view data as a, normally you view it as a fixed entity, so then it's a representation of that point in time. But in having this setup, you can actually start to see it as a live entity, because you can start to diffuse it. And then you'll start to see how it propagates through uh, the digital realm, which is essentially a representation of the physical realm. Um, but that, that's why I, and that's where some of my personal research will start to go, is trying to look into that. So how do we conclude on all of this? Um, I think that. One of the, one guy that does a really good job at it is a Danish painter named uh, Asper Jorn that uh, had this uh, quote inside of uh, his, one of his books. Uh, main, uh, this, this is from Concerning Form. And what I'm mainly interested in is the top paragraph. So for the artist, the instrument is a means to express himself better and to renew his true abilities. And when I first read that, I was like, yes, computers. That, that's the new instrument. So, so that's where we as architects or artists can start to explore new realms. But as I have gone through this presentation and been setting it up, I have realized that you also need Brunelleschi. Uh, Brunelleschi was the guy that did the, the dome of Florence. Um, and no one still really knows how he did it. And he figured it out based on a knowledge of geometry, form, and technology, where the, the emphasis is on technology. So by developing these cranes, that would then make it possible to lift things up. So what I'm starting to become an advocate for is not necessarily computational literacy, but a technological literacy. So instead of the model I had at first, where you have an architect that's in the drawing, that send something to a contractor that may send something back, we can actually have the architect and this loop where the architect through a certain literacy of technology and thereby also computation will have this uh, self-contained loop where they can explore everything. They can explore drawing, technology, making, and revise it over and over again. And I'm not saying that we as architects should take over the act of making, like take over carpentry or anything like that. 
we should just have a technological knowledge of what is already there and how, does the, how do they work and how can we apply that. That is often done by doing it yourself, but there is also a very good example based on a Danish designer named Finn Yu, who, when he had to make new projects, he would go out to his, his friends that had manufacturing companies and furniture, uh, manufacturing facilities and so on, and then he would just look at them and be like, what's new? Uh, what, what's your newest machine and what can it do? Oh, okay, and then he would walk around the shop and he would be introduced to all the machines and he would be told what every machine could do. And then he would be like, great, that's fantastic, I'll send you some stuff because we can work together. So then he started to do that and that by default also made his furniture a lot cheaper than everything else because it wasn't necessarily bespoke. It fit within a technological paradigm. Right now, we're just in a different time where Technology is becoming more and more accessible. Almost everyone has a 3D, or not everyone, but people are starting to have 3D printers at home. Uh, I've recently seen this uh, autonomous CNC router that people are funding on Kickstarter and all kinds of other things. And things are just becoming more accessible. So I see a future where we can be a little bit like Fenu, where we know of the fabrication processes and we use that as an integral part of our uh, design and explorations as we go forward. Thank you.